All right, if potential is a useful concept, and I promise you it is, then we need to know how to find it, and know how to get it from situations that we have, and then apply it to new situations. Often, we will find the potential in any given situation by inverting the energy relation. In other words, if we remember that we started with the idea that the potential energy was whatever charge you have times the potential at that point, then we should be able to turn that around and say that the potential is the potential energy over the charge. Uh, for technical reasons, we should use a test charge and we should take it as it gets smaller. What we want to do is say, we want to abstract out the effect of the test charge. So we want to make it a smaller and smaller thing. Larger charges will pull on everything else in the situation and change things. We'd like to make the impact minimal. Having said that, in the context of this class, almost always the charge will just be an explicit thing and we'll just divide it out. But it can be more complicated uh, in more advanced applications. To illustrate, we'll fall back on our favorite easy example, the parallel plate capacitor. Remember a capacitor that has uh, one charge on one side and the equivalent opposite charge on the other side. This is a capacitor of charge Q uh, because we'll know that one side is plus Q and the other side is minus Q. Capacitors should always just give the size of the positive charge. All right, we're going to choose our coordinate system such that x equals 0 is on the negative plate and x equals d is on the positive plate. Uh, and then we can set our potential energy to be zero anywhere we want. We can always choose the zero point for potential energy at least once in the problem. We're going to choose it at x equals zero. It doesn't change any of the physics, but it makes some of the expressions a little bit simpler. And notice, as mentioned before, that in moving the particle from here to here, if it's a positive particle, it's going to gain electrical energy, electric potential energy, because the field is doing negative work on it. What kind of work? Well, remember that work is always the force times the distance times the cosine of right f delta x cosine of the angle between them. But here the force is just QE. And the angle between them is 180 degrees because the object is moving to the right, but the field points to the left. Cosine of 180 degrees is minus 1, and so we get that the work done is negative Q times electric field times X. Way back from mechanics, the definition of potential energy is that the change of potential energy is minus the work done. So the change of energy between X and 0 is minus the work done going from 0 to X. So it's just negative of this expression. So the change of potential energy is Q times the field times the distance, the coordinate. Of course, since u is 0 when x is 0, delta u ends up being just u of, at the position x. All right, wrapping all of that up and together, we can say, taking this electric field that we had, that the electric potential energy at a distance x from the negative plate is little q times big Q over epsilon naught a times the distance from the plate. As an aside, that looks a lot like u equals mgh. Notice that we have the charge, and then some sort of field strength, and then some sort of distance from a reference point. Not surprisingly, the parallel plate capacitor, in general, since it gives us the constant electric field, will look a lot like a gravitational situation. We weren't really interested in the electric potential energy itself. We were interested in the uh, potential at that point. But that's easy enough to do. We divide out the test charge q. And it actually justifies out. We don't need any kind of limit. And we get that the potential at a point x is just the charge on the capacitor times x over the area with this correction factor thrown in. If you prefer, you can certainly think of this as 4 pi coulomb constant times qx over a. And you can kind of see where the epsilon stuff's coming in this kind of weird geometric factor is annoying to carry around, these four pi's that pop up and go away and so on. Uh, they're coming from integrals, and it's just sort of absorbed into the epsilon if we, uh, if we use the epsilon factor. So that's why you'll see that people use that. All right, if the plates are separated by a distance d, and the capacitor is connected to a known source of potential, let's say a battery, that maintains a potential difference of delta v across the plates, or between the plates, then we can find the electric field as just E equals delta V over D. 
That is, we can establish a uniform field of any desired strength just by controlling delta V and varying D. These are technologically easy to do. Build a battery, separate the plates. Uh, and then you get your constant E field. And since a constant E field is technologically often very useful, this ends up being a good piece of engineering that we can do. Also notice that this equation implies electric field could be measured in volts per meter. Volts per meter. We've been measuring electric field in newtons per coulomb because we said that the electric field was also the force over the charge. These turn out to be equivalent. You can play with them and show that uh, basically from the definitions that is true. And so you can use whichever is convenient, either volts per meter or newtons per coulomb, and you should be aware that those are actually the same term. Notice that the voltage grows linearly in the capacitor. This is an important feature of capacitors. It's not a general straight statement, but it, since capacitors are both ubiquitous and useful, it's worth knowing that the potential difference at any point, the potential at any point is based on the total potential difference and the fraction of the distance you've covered. If you go 3 quarters of the way away from the negative plate, you pick up 3 quarters of the total potential. As you can imagine, that's also a useful thing. There are several ways that we can describe the potential at different points in space. These are three common ways of doing it, and we'll use all of them at different features. Um, we can draw them as a potential graph. We can sketch what are called equipotential surfaces, or we can make what's called an equipotential map. And over the next couple of slides, we'll talk about these each explicitly. Uh, this graph, which in the notes you might want to return to, tries to show the equivalent points on these, that this value at one meter of 0.5 volts is also what's represented on this 0.5 volt sheet, which is also represented by this 0.5 volt line. And it's likewise for the two volts. Uh, the, sorry, the x equals 2, the 1 volt. All right. A potential graph is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a graph where the position is on one axis and the potential at that position is on the other. These are optimal for one-dimensional cases, like we just had, and less so for potentials in which there are two or three dimensions. Although you could imagine with a two-dimensional potential, if you had variance in x and y, then you could imagine a two-dimensional graph where you would have, you know, x on one axis, y on the other axis, and the potential on the z-axis. And then you could imagine having some more complicated shape that would tell you what your, where your potentials are on that shape. Um, not fun, not particularly easy to draw, as you can see, but useful. If you have potential varying in three spaces, x, y, and z, then it becomes essentially impossible to describe it with a single graph, although you could take slices and do what any, other, any other kind of three-dimensional representation that you want. Calc 3 is the kind of class that deals with three-dimensional stuff a lot and would help you on that if you're interested. We have some other techniques, though, that we're also going to use. We can draw what are called equipotential surfaces. An equipotential surface is a mathematical surface, not necessarily a physical, corresponding to a physical surface. It's just one you put out there mentally. And on that mathematical surface, the potential has the same value everywhere. That is, on that surface, all potentials are equal, hence the equipotential. It's a lot like a topographic map if you look at, like, a picture of the local environs from the U.S. Geological Service, they'll have a map where there'll be bumps raised and lowered for where heights or depths are. And so likewise, an equipotential surface is sort of like that. Since the potential in the capacitor depends only on how far you are from the negative plate, remember that it was just x over d times the total potential difference, then the equipotential surfaces are each simply planes parallel to the plates. In other words, it doesn't matter if you think of like an x, y, z axis where we have um, something like this. This is x, this is y, and this is z. Your values of, of y and z don't matter. Only the values of x matter. So everybody on this sheet, no matter what coordinate x, y, and z they have, they all have the 0.5 volts. And everybody on this sheet has 1 volt, and so on. By the way, don't get overly thrown out here that they only drew these two sheets. There's as many sheets as you want, any value of voltage, but it's usual it's usual to pick kind of fixed values that step between your max and min, just to make it easier to read. And then one other way of representing things are what are called isolines 
or Ecopotential Maps. Uh, your textbook likes Ecopotential Map, and the AP committee loves ISO lines. They like it; just sounds cool and Star Trekky, so they use it a lot. An ISO line is a two-dimensional slice through an equipotential surface, such that every point on the line has the same potential. So it's each line here is now drawing the same potential. Again, for a parallel plate capacitor, since being at a value of x is all that matters, anywhere on this line is the same potential. Anywhere on this line is the same potential, although these two are different. We'll talk more about ISO lines in their own little uh, section shortly. All right, change of topic a little bit. That was the potential due to a parallel plate capacitor. They are the easiest. They are the simplest. They produce constant field. Uh, they give you linear voltages. Things are nice. The other thing you'd want to know is potential due to a point charge. That is conceptually the easiest thing, although it will turn out that it's not mathematically the absolute easiest thing, but it isn't too bad either. Consider a test charge Q sub T, which is brought near some other point charge Q. We know that together they have an electric potential energy, which is given by Coulomb constant times the product of the charges over the distance. Keep in mind here that it's the distance, it's not R squared. Why? Because we're talking about energies, not forces. All right, it's a dimensional requirement. It is a little weird that the electrical energy looks a lot like the electric force. Uh, it's a feature of calculus. It's a weird, f just the way the real numbers work. Just keep in mind, they look similar, but there's a extra power on the forces. Keep track of which one you're talking about. All right, since QT is our test charge, then we take this definition. We say, take the limit as of U electric over QT, but U electric over QT, the QT just drops out, so the limit doesn't really matter and we get that the voltage of a point charge is kq over r, where r is the distance to the point charge from the point you're talking about. Here are our three representations according to that. v is proportional to 1 over r, so we get a hyper hyperbolic branch here, like this. Um, this is assuming that q is positive. If q were negative, of course, it would just flip the graph, which I'll try and sketch but badly. Um, so keep in mind that, that a positive charge has a voltage that points upward, and a negative charge has a voltage that points downward. Or we can do equipotential surfaces, which since everything at a fixed distance has the same voltage, since only R matters, then in three-dimensional space, the object that is uh, a measure of distances, uh, things of constant distance, is the sphere, and so the equipotential surfaces become just spheres. They're hard to draw, which is why they had to kind of carve out these little windows. They don't obviously, right, they obviously don't really exist. It's a solid sphere, but we have these little transparent things to look in. Uh, notice the spacing is not quite even. If we want to have even voltage spacings, then we'll have different uh, spacings in R. And that's best shown in the isolinear map, where we have these are now equally spaced values of V, but because V is 1 over R, the circles are not equally spaced. Remember, these circles are slices through this sphere, so the spheres are not evenly spaced either. That as we get more voltage out, we have to go further. And that's because of the 1 over bit. To get the same change, we have to, to the same change in voltage, we have to go further out. All right, a useful factoid from calculus that is hard to justify, and I will not. Uh, this is what's called a shell theorem, which sounds a little bit like a con game, but the shell theorem says outside a spherical collection of charge, i.e. a shell, the potential looks exactly as if all of that charge were located at the center. In other words, if we have a sphere of some radius, but we want to find the potential when we're out here, and the sphere has charge Q total, then it looks like a point charge with charge Q total as long as we are outside the sphere. Inside the sphere it's more complicated and it's not a thing that the AP committee wants you to deal with because it's really hard to do without calculus. All right, if we attach the sphere of radius R to a battery with known potential V0, um, meaning that the potential at the surface is V0, then we can figure out how much charge must be on the sphere by just inverting this thing, saying when R equals big R, V should equal V0. And we find that Q total is four uh, v is V0 over R over K, 
or 4 pi epsilon naught r v0. And then we could plug that back into here and find the potential anywhere to be the potential on the sphere times the radius of the sphere over how far we are. And we should be very, very careful to say that r must be bigger or equal to, v to big R. Right. Um, again, useful factoid. It's not unusual to be charging spheres, so that's useful to, to think about. Um, it's hard to get point charges, but it's easy to get spheres. And then the, the potential due to multiple charges. The electric field, field obeys superposition. Oops. Which is no more or less than saying that the total electric field is just the sum of each electric field. And you might find that curious and we're like, why do we even have to say that? But it turns out there are many things in mathematics that do not, that would mix two terms. Um, squares, for instance, are not uh, superposable, right? That A plus B quantity squared, right? The counter is something like A plus B quantity squared is A squared plus B squared plus a mixing term. And there are many things in physics that obey more like that than straight up. But it turns out that a lot of the stuff we do is linearly superposable this way. And the electric field is one of them, that we can find the total electric field literally just by adding all the fields. Um, and because that's true, then the potential due to a collection of charges is the sum of the potentials due to each one. In other words, we would do the work calculation for each one, and we would just add them up to get the total work done. Why do we care? Because potential is a scalar. So unlike the electric field, when we add them, we're not going to have any of these weird vector complications. We'll still have some geometry going on because we'll need the distance from each point to the point of interest. And that might not be simple. But it's almost always easier than trying to track different vector directions. The total potential, then, is just the sum of all the individual potentials. So it's kq1 over r1 plus kq2 over r2, where r1 is the distance of r point to the q1, and r2 is the distance of the point we care about to q2, etc. I guess for future reference. For example, the potential at the black dot at this location is the Coulomb constant, which is, of course, all that this thing is. Right? This is just the Coulomb constant. And then we have um, Q2 over, or Q1 over R1, R1 and Q2 over R2. And then we just do some calculation. I'm going to pull out the Newtons, the units here, the oops, Newton Coulomb per centimeter. And then I'm left with 2 over 5, which is 0.4, and minus 1 over 4, which is 0.25, and with a minus sign. And then I'm going to convert the unit. And this is just going to do something which, notice, essentially is going to cancel out that, which is what it's for. So Newton Coulombs per centimeter, 1 Coulomb in every 10 to the 9 Newton nano Coulombs. Sorry. Um, times 100 centimeters for every meter. And when all is said and done, you get 135 newton meters per joule. A newton meter is, of course, a coulomb, and a joule per coulomb is a volt. So the potential difference here is 135 volts. And all we had to do was figure out each of these individual ones and add them.